Got a super panel here for us. We've had a lot of discussion around the various sectors and, and logistics has, has come out as, as one of the hot topics. So we really wanted to drill down onto that, particularly for the CE region. So we've got Robert Dobritsky, who's CEO of Panatoni. Um, we've got Renato Sieka, who's managing partner for Axiomo Group. Natalia Krushnerik, who's partner for CMS Cameron McKenna. Um, Harry Bannatine, who's partner head of industrial agency for CE at Colliers International, um, and Frank Schuholtz, who's a founder of FMS Advisors. Let's just start with some very brief introductions, just so that everybody knows who everybody is. So very quick introductions. Um, just take a minute um, just on yourself and the company. Um, Natalia, let's just start with you. Quick, quick introductions. So I'm Natalia Kushneruk, a partner uh, with real estate and construction team uh, in Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, CMS is the fourth uh, largest uh, law firm worldwide and is the biggest uh, law firm in CE. So we are very pl well placed to, to serve uh, our clients, especially in logistics and uh, warehouses uh, sector uh, in uh, CE in general and Ukraine in particular. Great, thank you. Frank. Yes, thank you, Richard. My name is Frank Schuholz. I'm the founder of FMS Advisors. I'm active since actually 1998 in the logistics sector. 2003, since 2003, focus on railway. And uh, in 2016, I've uh, set up my own company, advising clients across various sectors on uh, multimodal um, uh, supply chain concepts with a well special eye and focus on the uh, uh, Belden Road initiative, which is, has appeared since 2013 on the screen. Super, thanks very much. Renata. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Renata Oshetska. I'm managing partner and the founder of Axima Group. Uh, we are a real estate agency in Polish market and uh, we mainly operate in logistic and office sector. We are on the market since uh, for 11 years now. Super, thanks very much. Robert. Robert Dobrzycki, uh, I am CEO of Panatoni Europe. Panatoni is a um, privately owned US-based uh, real estate development company focused on industrial logistics. Uh, and I'm running a European operation for the company. Super, thank you. Harry. Hi, I'm Harry Banatine. I am uh, based out of Prague. As you can maybe tell by my accent, I am not from Czech and uh, I hope you understand my Scottish English. I have been in Prague in Czech Republic for 12 years now, concentrating on logistics and industrial. And in the last two years, I changed from JLL and I'm now in Colliers International, um, running the INL for Czech, but also helping to oversee CEE. Natalia, let's, let's just start with you. Um, just just pick up on some of the key trends that you're seeing in, in the region. So what we see in uh, CE uh, warehouse and logistics sector is that uh, this sector has become one of the most uh, sought uh, after assets for investors. And it now uh, ranks in, uh, as I recall, third place after offices and residential and having uh, overtaken retail already. So uh, logistics uh, share in investment has rocketed to, uh, as, as far as I recall, 30% of the total investment activity. However, the supply uh, of the assets for, for sale is somewhat limited because uh, the major um, developers and investors in the region are a long term holders. This is especially relevant for Czech, as I recall, uh, 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 Harry, please collect me, and uh, Hungary. So, but uh, even though in Poland, the share of logistics investment has reached a record of 48% in total of the total investment and thus uh, Poland definitely dominates among CE countries. So uh, regarding the demand over the last couple of years uh, we have seen demand from uh, various sectors uh, mainly from uh, three-party logistics, from retail, from uh, distribution sector followed by uh, light, some light production, autom automotive and FMCG. As a general trend for uh, 2020 during the pandemic, we experienced increased demand from sectors such as e-commerce, uh, data centers, and some specialist storage. And we, uh, ex uh, we expect that e-commerce and other sectors will continue to grow uh, in um, even more rapid speed and will drive demand. Uh, we, will, we also expect from more a uh, long-term perspective that 
and some uh, and the, uh, the demand will grow from the producers and manufacturers who potentially will bring their manufacturing and some parts of their supply chain uh, for, uh, closer to Europe to mitigate some uh, certain of their risks. We also seen as a trend that a lot, uh, um, quite a high percentage of new supply was constructed on the build to suit basis, and this is relevant both for Ukraine and Bulgaria as well. So, uh, w and uh, w a lot of people all now discuss uh, uh, near shoring and hope a lot of them uh, hope to benefit from that. Uh, Carrie, uh, anything else uh, you, you can add? I think in general, 2020 has taught many companies a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. I think it's accelerated things that were already happening on the market, automation sort of declining. Also using automation in warehouse. And I think because of the risk in supply chain, as Natalia said, a lot of people that offshored will start to come back and I think CEE will be the biggest winner of this because central located, still very cost effective and it's gone leaps and bounds in the last few years with, in terms of connectivity, power, etc. And also infrastructure in general. So. I think for CEE, this nearshoring will definitely, we will see to start. We're already getting requests for this. Uh, I think it will take time. But in the interim, the e-commerce will continue to grow and grow throughout CE. Because um, we are way behind Western Europe still on this. And if you look at Poland, it's just been an unbelievable story for Poland. I mean, the stock in Poland is more than the stock in Czech, Hungary and Slovakia put together. And also the consumer demand in Poland is also growing and growing. And you can see now that uh, Poland competes with Western markets and even exceeding many Western markets now. So. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, just that the potential for growth there, particularly when you when you look at the e-commerce side, um, and I'm going to pick that up in a second. Um, Frank, just just coming to you. Um, I mean, we've we've heard there quite a bit about um, changes in terms of infrastructure, more opportunity for CE than than other areas. Um, how do you see this region, particularly? Um, I suppose putting that in a, in a global context. I mean, what we have seen, especially during the last nine months, was that um, uh, Poland and the CE region has benefited from the fact that there was a land connection from uh, the Far East into, uh, into Europe. And that is what uh, also Harry already mentioned, that we will see definitely a trend towards nearshoring. What we have seen in the, um, in the railway sector and uh, coming to the infrastructure part, the volumes uh, have almost doubled. Uh, compared to 2019 when you talk about rail. So uh, previous year we had approximately 200, 250,000 TUs up to October 2019. Now we're already about 400,000 TUs which we have seen imported from China. Lots and lots of uh, uh, personal protective equipment obviously on that. Um, but that is uh, definitely something where Poland and the whole CE region have benefited from simply because they could ensure that the uh, supply chains would work uh, over land, whilst we have seen that uh, there were major interruptions in the sea freight part, simply because as the pandemic started in China, ports were closed. Then still we had cargo on the way, um, moving by ship into the Western and um, also Baltic ports. But then afterwards, it was simply chaos because no one could access anymore the factories, the containers were not delivered to the ports, and then everything more or less came to a standstill air freight rates rocketing yeah, and also with uh, with limited capacities there simply because the passenger flights were not available anymore so rail was definitely something which uh, could show and demonstrate that there is a liable link between uh, far east and, and europe and that will continue okay good um robert obviously active in in ce but but other areas as well it's been an extraordinary um year 2020 um, so how have you seen that? And also, how do you see the, the, the uh, I suppose, the CE markets in comparison to the other markets where you're active? It was a pretty extraordinary year. Uh, 
started normally, then we went into a pandemic kind of a period and a lot of uncertainty, especially early days uh, around Europe uh, on the capital side, but also on the, on the tenant demand side. And it was unclear how the market, the industrial logistic market would react and which way it's going to go. I mean, after a couple of weeks, it was pretty clear uh, this market, this segment of the real estate will be least affected. Uh, and, all, and then later, it occurred that this, this, this might be kind of a so-called winner, if anything can be a winner out of pandemic. Uh, so this year, he stopped, I mean, it's going to be for, for our company, best ever year. Uh, overall in Europe, but definitely in Central Europe in terms of tenant demand and uh, probably is going to end up as the best one ever also uh, investor demand wise. So the investor side came a bit later, recovered a bit later during the kind of a pandemic. There was a bit more uncertainty, I guess. A lot of investors or banks or financial institutions were involved in other sectors and it was slowing them down, but obviously they followed and they are currently having the same view as the kind of a market specialist as we are, which we are not obviously exposed to other markets, but that only to that one. So overall, it's going to be a very good year, very strong year. And uh, as, as we all know, Central Europe uh, is much behind in terms of stock uh, per capita and obviously e-commerce growth e-commerce kind of a penetration so i mean in western europe there is a huge potential e-commerce wise so you can only imagine how much growth it is ahead of uh, central europe and also you have this phenomenon uh, of poland and czech republic that they are bordering the largest economy in europe and so far these countries were serving this uh, this big uh, por portion of europe uh, production wise but currently it is becoming pretty obvious that this is also, especially Western borders, Western parts, are also kind of e-commerce hubs for Germany and Western Europe. So overall, very positive outlook. Uh, looks like we saw in a very short time frame uh, trends that were supposed to be showing up for a long time, for the, for the, during the longer period of time. And it, it's, I think it, is, it was a pretty useful lesson to see uh, how it could look like and where are the trends because it was within the very short period of time. So, so I think years ahead are pretty in a bright colors. Uh, obviously, pandemic is still around. So, 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 I mean, it is affecting our daily lives, but industrial logistics is kind of a clear beneficiary of the, of the, of the shift. And the shift is pretty clear. It was clear but now it's really <laughs> super clear. <laughs> right, it's really brought it into focus. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Renata, ju just give me your view on that as well and, and drill down a little bit, if you can, um, into particularly the, the Polish market. As everyone said, the pandemic has revealed the strength of the sector and uh, demonstrated how solid its fundamentals are. So uh, all the trends were accelerated and um, driving demand for warehouse space, mainly online shopping. Uh, on the demand side, we have seen K-shaped growth trajectory. This means that different groups of occupiers have uh, diverged from each other. And uh, we have those um, that have been growing, like e-commerce, couriers, FMCG sector, pharmaceuticals, companies, and um, DIY retailers. And then we have those who have been shrinking. Uh, so for example, companies connected to Horeca sector and uh, traditional retailers. So due to this uh, polarization, investors, developers now assesses the quality and credit worthiness of tenants more carefully than previously. And they uh, scrutinize the wider sector of occupiers operation. And uh, on the other hand, we have uh, the situation that property owners start to believe that it is maybe better to allow a certain level of vacancy in a building and uh, wait for a quality, quality tenant rather than to uh, lease up the space uh, quickly. And this strategy makes uh, sense because the supply dynamics is changing as well. 
and the first uh, half of 2020 uh, was marked only a bit marked only a bit of development boom and the developer had lower activity uh, mainly because they have they are constrained by um, by a more conservative approach by banks uh, to lending and um, also the banks require higher pre-let um, proportion. Um, the type of product has changed a little bit. Um, developers responded to the market and more last mile schemes uh, are being offered. And um, moreover, e-commerce acquires seek to improve the, uh, the competitive edge and shortening uh, delivery time. So, so they invest a lot in automation solution. Um, and on the other hand, we have another trend recently observed is uh, the rise in green solutions. This is driven um, by the market, both of buyers and investors. Um, they both require that uh, buildings are more sustainable. And the last, maybe uh, I would mention, and Harry mentioned as well, that investment market, um, where has this been <laughs> the right spot uh, has proven the immunity to the COVID pandemic and investors continue to be drawn to the sector income, stability and shift. Uh, they shift the allocation away from retail to warehouses. And as Harry mentioned, this sector is, has reached uh, 1.9 billion euro in, uh, in Poland. And that is record, despite the fact that we have still one more quarter to go. So it sounds really positive. And, uh, and Harry, let's let's pick that up. I mean, everybody seems very bullish around the logistics sector, and we've heard, you know, that it's been the best year, um, twenty twenty, for some time, particularly in Poland. Um, is that true also of the other CE markets, Harry? What what's happening in 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 the Czech Republic? What's happening in uh, in Romania, Hungary? Are there differences? Um, I think. Obviously, there's vast difference in size, but in general, the general concept, yes. I think uh, investors are also looking that never would have considered uh, logistics. I and L are now, as was said before, I think by Robert, was that the proportion of forty percent they maybe put into uh, retail or standard retail shopping centres, they are now reallocating that to I and L. And in general, for um, and there is many investors out there. The problem is lack of product, I would say, and not people wanting to buy. And if I take Czech Republic, which is probably the hardest right now to do permitting, it's not helpful because uh, so the land in Czech is very difficult to get, especially uh, Robert will know this. Especially around Prague and Brno and the main the main hubs. The pricing for this has also gone up quite high, so then the rents have to somehow eat this. Good, Richard. You wanted to pick up something. Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, Frank about the major uh, transport infrastructure issues um, around Central and Eastern Europe, and I understand you know there's a trend towards logistics hubs uh, in China and coming more in Europe. And I'm wondering how Central and Eastern Europe fits into that. Well, Richard, uh, what we have seen, for example, in China, that at the beginning, um, the Chinese government tried to connect almost every major city to every major European city. And that has come sort of uh, towards an, uh, a resolution that as of 2021, there will be five major logistics hubs when we talk about rail connected um, uh, supply chains. Um, and I think we will see something similar in Europe. For the moment, these hubs, are, the major hubs are all in Germany, the Netherlands, France. And I think here is a good opportunity for the Central and Eastern European region to catch up on that. Because um, what we have heard already, that there are record levels of investment for warehousing built to suit. So that also here, from an infrastructure perspective, we can see that the, the efforts to uh, be part of this consolidation of uh, building up hubs could be uh, something which is occurring in Poland um, as well as in, for example, in Hungary, because uh, Warsaw, Łódź, uh, but also Budapest, these are sort of the most common, as well as Prague, uh, these are the most common uh, hubs we see. Uh, what the Central and Eastern European countries have not so far uh, delivered really upon was uh, air freight, because there you see the major hubs, that's London, that's Paris, that's 
Amsterdam, Frankfurt. Uh, well, we have seen Budapest growing quite, quite well. And uh, we are uh, sort of all awaiting the next steps for the Solidarity Transportation Hub, which uh, should occur a couple of years from now in Poland. But there is definitely room to grow and also to connect the supply chains um, into directly into Central and Eastern Europe and not being served either from the West or Northern ports or the Adriatic ports. And that is one of the, the key elements I would be looking at. Um, also how I could secure as an investor or as a, as a customer from a various sectors to, um, uh, to make sure that I get my supplies secured. Learning from the pandemic situation we are currently in where a lot of shortages have happened. So when you say like a logistics hub, you mean a group of cities together rather than um, some developments. And if, if I understand correctly, and where could the major transport uh, logistics hubs be in Central and Eastern Europe? Well, it can be a couple of cities, but it can also be one major city, which is then sort of uh, uh, providing the necessary infrastructure. I mean, what you see, for example, when you talk, when you look into Germany, there, the, the Duisburg region is pretty well known in the entire logistics industry as being the major inland hub. And something similar, obviously, um, to, to, uh, to build up in Central Eastern Europe would be difficult simply because we do not have inland waterways in Central Eastern Europe of the size and magnitude as we have that in, in the Duisburg area. But um, it could be one, one region, actually. For example, uh, the, at the crossroads of the railway corridors uh, traveling from north to south in, uh, in Poland, it would be the Łódź area. It could be also very well the Poznan area because it's quite close to, um, to Germany where we have a lot of uh, e-commerce hubs uh, being, being established with, with Amazon, with Zalando, with others, uh, sort of setting that one up. And then further to the south, for example, in the Budapest area. But that all depends on further infrastructure developments, um, being railways, being roads, which interconnect then uh, these countries to really make uh, seamless cargo flows uh, possible for, for customers. That's an interesting point there, I think. Um, and uh, Robert, just just coming to you, um, you know, there's an, an awful lot of capital, which Harry mentioned there, um, looking, coming into the market. Um, but some of that capital may not be as experienced as of either the sector or potentially um, of the region. Do we think that logistics has had a huge growth this year, but actually won't get the same level of growth next year? because that's when the other sectors will be recovering. I suppose, what's your sense of that? Oh, my sense of it is, I mean, clearly this year showed the trend in a very short period of time, which will continue going forward. And uh, some investors were obviously investing in retail and offices. This trends are not clear. Obviously, definitely not retail trend is not clear. Uh, but also office, uh, we still don't know what's, what's the outcome of the pandemic for the office sector. So this is also a bit kind of a question mark right now. And it, historically, retail and office sectors were much, much bigger than industrial sectors. So there is no need for a big shift in, within the sectors, capital-wise, to have a huge impact on the logistics in a positive terms. And this is happening, and it will happen, and it, 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 continue, it continues to, to, to happen. And you're right, you, you're absolutely right that, I mean, it's growing so fast, and the allocation is quite substantial, that there is probably a bit of lack of investment knowledge and also lack of kind of investment execution uh, in Central Europe, which is improving over time. But I mean, this is this is the story of Central Europe. It is growing from from a very low basis. So obviously, also kind of a knowledge has to grow, which is happening. Which is happening, but uh, looks like for logistics, it has to happen a bit faster right now because of the shift. So I, I would say I would be quite optimistic going forward and uh, as said I mean the amount of capital versus size of the asset class it's obviously something interesting and uh, I think the growth is ahead and we just started the, the, the journey and uh, I think it's pretty exciting time for the sector. Okay good. Um, Natalia, Ukraine has been off 
the investment map, or at least from our perspective as we see it for some time. Um, so maybe just, just take a couple of minutes just to give us a, a little brief insight on that um, and, and the, what's happening at the moment in terms of Ukraine. I'm very happy to do that, Richard. So uh, just to give uh, the Ukrainian uh, warehouse market uh, can be defined as the one which has a very high demand, a very strong demand, but very short supply. And domestic lines uh, dominate, but we also see the, the, uh, the in uh, increasing interest from the uh, international clients. So just to give you some um, overview of the market, uh, the, the total stock for Ukrainian mar logistics market is uh, around 3 million uh, uh, square meters. And to, to, give the, uh, to put this into the picture of all uh, other CE countries, uh, in uh, uh, Poland, someone mentioned that the total stock is over 19 uh, uh, million square meters. And uh, for instance, in Czech, uh, it's around 9 million. Uh, even though Ukraine is the biggest uh, country within Europe. So you can imagine uh, what the potential, what potential Ukraine still has. Uh, over the past few years, we have been observing uh, um, increased uh, interest in the uh, warehousing market and its activity uh, in the different locations, but mainly uh, warehouse market uh, in the entire country is focused uh, in, in near Kyiv, which is the capital of the city and the Kyiv region. So. Uh, Similarly to other C jurisdiction, as uh, Ukrainian uh, warehouse market was least affected by the pandemic compared with the other commercial real estate uh, segment. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we have a, a strong shortage of warehouse space, and uh, this driven the vacancy rate to. 2.5 percent, and even uh, with the pre prime. Um, uh, A-class uh, warehouses, the uh, vacancy rate is at or around zero. So regarding the uh, the um, uh, the rent rates, just uh, the uh, prime rate uh, for Kyiv region warehouse is approximately four point five uh, euro per square meter, while in other C uh, countries the uh, rent rate rise from three to five euro per square meter. And regarding yields, this is something which uh, differs the Ukrainian uh, warehouse market uh, a lot from other CE countries. The yields, primary uh, yields in Ukraine uh, are um, 13 to 14 percent, while compared to other CE countries, the yields are uh, vary from 5 to maximum 9 percent. So this is something uh, really significant. Uh, what, what regarding the, uh, the demand? The demand is driven mainly, as in other CE countries, by grocery, supermarkets, increased e-commerce and logistics. So what we, uh, um, regarding the trends, what we see uh, for 2025, we uh, see a, a, a significant uh, growth of cargo transshipment via Ukrainian ports, which is led mainly by international cargo. And we expect this trend to, to grow. And uh, uh, we expect that this will uh, um, transform in the development of the uh, uh, specialized warehouses near or in the seaports. Uh, sea so um, we are now also expect the number of uh, uh, warehouses in the pipeline to be commissioned in 2021. And we do very much hope that uh, and await that uh, uh, revival of the development uh, activity and basically uh, that shortage of supply will, so uh, will somehow be decreased. Okay, good. I will take it upon myself to monitor the Ukrainian logistics sector a little more in detail from now on. Um, good. Um, question that's come in here from, uh, from Irina, thanks very much, from PMA. Um, what is the gap between headline and effective rents in logistics assets in Poland? Have incentives changed since the beginning of the pandemic? 
I mean, that's an interesting one. Um, does anybody want? I, does anybody want to pick that up? Any any information anybody has, particularly about the Polish market on that? We we observe that the rents are still um, at the same level. So um, there is obviously a gap between the headline and effective rent, depending on the region, on location, on the project type, etc. So it's. Um, it's difficult to say it in general, right? But uh, in summary, we uh, we expect some um, some grow, rental growth potential. Uh, that uh, that is because of availability remains meaning um, because availability is decreasing. Um, vacancy rate uh, was increased uh, in Q3 up to eight percent, but um, due to the number of spec projects that were started before the pandemic and were delivered to the market. Uh, but this space will be uh, shortly absorbed and uh, in, in the coming months, uh, because of the financing conditions for developers uh, that they are tightened and uh, banks, as I mentioned, require approximately 50% of pre-letting, uh, we have uh, seen significant drop in speculative development. So it is currently 26% of all space under construction, which is down for, from almost 50% at the end of 2019. Uh, so as the consequences, uh, we expect uh, that um, uh, that availability to fall steadily in coming quarters and that should eventually put uh, upward uh, pressure on rents in the medium and um, medium uh, term horizon. Uh, rents obviously in Poland are very competitive and uh, maybe this is something which is not uh, very well uh, um, perceived by investors but uh, obviously it uh, allows uh, to, to grow the market quickly and um, sometimes we can have uh, even 40% lower uh, comparison to Germany, for example, but, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, the different projects, different markets, we expect uh, rental uh, grow um, in the medium term perspective. It was raised there particularly um, by Irina for, for Poland. Um, Harry, is there any change between, I suppose, the headline and effective rents in logistics assets more broadly across CAE? What's the position? Um, I think they have contracted slightly during the pandemic, but because of lack of supply and great demand. I mean, Poland is a completely different story, I believe, from like for Czech, because obviously between Czech and Poland, we fight for a lot of the same clients, between offices, etc., and between developers. And uh, sometimes when we see the comparison table, nearly everything in Czech starts with a four, and everything in Poland doesn't start with a four. So, and I think the gap in Poland from uh, maybe changing now, but from net effective to thing is much bigger than any other uh, CE country. Okay, good. And and Robert, in terms of the in terms of the potential for that, and also looking at that those fundamentals in terms of of rental. I mean, given that there's less speculative development. Um, given that there's higher demand, does that mean that we should expect to see rents going up in the area or do you expect to see more development in the area? It's hard to expect uh, in the in the medium to short, short to medium term kind of rental growth in Poland. Uh, I guess infrastructure is still being built and uh, supply is not fully stabilized yet. The demand is enormous. It's huge. And obviously it's coming from Western Europe. And uh, it is obviously a big benefit for Poland, where you have obviously cheaper rents and availability of development sites. And many large customers are choosing Poland over other countries in Central Europe because of that, because of the rental tone, because of the availability and execution permitting, which, which helps Poland tremendously. And also it increases the size of the market very fast. So it's becoming the largest market in uh, by far in Central Europe. And over time, this size and this depth of the market would help to stabilize also kind of a rental uh, values. And I think with the stabilization of infrastructure, when it's going to be fully stabilized in terms of what it is, uh, I think the rents would start to go up and Poland is becoming and it will be a very deep, large market, also investment-wise.
there's a lot of discussion about more uh, onshoring or nearshoring, um, logistics running via CE through into Western Europe and particularly Germany, obviously. How do we see the prospects um, for that, but also then adding on, I'm assuming, Harry, that we're also looking at there being greater growth in terms of e-commerce demand as well, both within CEE as well as the ability to be able to provide some of that um, for, for Germany and other markets. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, we have, uh, well, Robert knows he has the biggest Amazon warehouse in Czech Republic, which services Germany. So if I order a package from my house and I live in Prague 6, it goes via Germany before it comes to me, which is a bit crazy. But in general, yes, and I think for an investor's point of view and for a developer's point of view, the leases are getting longer, so a longer walt. There is more automation being put in these warehouses. So you may be finding a warehouse of 40,000 square meters that the automation and the tenant spending within the building is actually more than the building. So they are not going to leave. So this is a good sign for investors as well and for developers. Uh, helps with the yields. And it, obviously the, the covenant of all this is very, very important now. And uh, I think it was mentioned at the beginning, the most important thing. Okay, good. Um, and uh, Harry mentioned it there, Robert. Um, are you are you beginning to see demand, I suppose, for more of this kind of e-commerce logistic um, based warehousing, um, which is also designed to serve the local CE markets, um, as well as being set up to, to serve Germany, as Harry mentioned there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we see that. Obviously, the scale is not is not as big as the Western European scale. Um, um, it's pretty obvious consumption size in central europe is still lower uh, but we see quite quite a kind of a strong demand uh, from that that sort of occupiers and obviously we build in the city close to the city centers as close as possible uh, and there is a pretty strong demand uh, for for this type of facilities so that that's that's pretty clear but it's not of the of the of the size yet of the western europe uh, but but it is definitely a big potential. It's difficult to quantify these things in, in years, especially since we're supposed to have moved five years in nine months, for example. <laughs> um, but I suppose, do you have an idea of, of how you see that, that moving? Is there something that, I mean, I don't know whether Harry, anything in your research is saying how quickly the, the curve is for catch up in CE in terms of that e-commerce side? Uh, I think if I had a crystal ball, I think this well, one, a vaccine. I think you saw the market shot up nearly 20% two weeks ago when the vaccine seemed more promising. It's also given more energy to investors. Um, and who knows how long this will take, how long it will go on. Uh, everyone is adapting to do virtual meetings, virtual walk around warehouses. We are even doing some with our phones. So this is all speeding up technology as well. Um, so yes, I think we also need to look at our planning, etc. Needs to change radically, especially in Czech Republic because it's so slow, uh, and in Poland, it's so much easier. So it's easier to give a time frame to a new customer. Um, even if you're on zoned land, it doesn't mean you can get a permit. Um, so I think across CE, everyone has a slightly different. Uh, position on this, but Poland is definitely the easiest. I'll we'll jump in with a question for Renata if I can. Uh, Renata, in terms of land in Poland and hotspots, where, where are your clients buying at the moment? Where are they looking? Are, are there any new hotspots coming up in Poland and Harry in the wider Central Eastern Europe? We are seeing particularly high demand for uh, urban plots uh, that are suitable for last mile e-commerce operations. Uh, they are therefore difficult to obtain and offer quite brownfield development, so it takes much uh, longer planning process uh, than, uh, than usual big box uh, projects, and um, that also offers higher rewards. So this segment of logistic real estate has highest potential for also for rental growth going forward. Um, E-commerce also requires regional, national, and international distribution hubs. 
And this uh, will continue support demand for land in a major logistic hub, its traditional location markets such as Central Poland, Warsaw area, Upper Silesia, and mm -hmm. others with, um, with high quality uh, transport infrastructure and economies of scale um, has then um, a service a higher number of um, consumer markets. And this location also help achieve higher levels of uh, efficiency as they ensure close proximity to subcontractors. Also, we believe that uh, medium-sized towns with a population of 20 up to 50,000, which are strategically located um, near key motorways, have also high potential as uh, for large fulfillment hubs. Uh, because they offer good connectivity and uh, well access to labor, and we have example of such towns uh, which uh, which already that uh, already attracted large scale uh, e commerce occupiers. Uh, recently, it was for example Świebodzie in Western Poland or Bolesławiec in Lower Silesia or Putna in Central Poland. So. I think the uh, Polish market has still a competitive advantage in the comparison with Western Europe and also takes uh, and also other sea uh, countries. So uh, you, you just uh, sum it up well. Administrative procedures are faster and easier, so that takes less time to, to deliver such a project. Just in terms of the, the, the opportunity or a key trend, whichever it is, just in kind of 30 seconds each, um, I suppose, where are you seeing the, the, the biggest opportunity for 2021 um, if, if we look at this particular logistics sector? Um, Natalia, let's start with you. 30 seconds, go. As far as I see, the opportunities are in a greater demand uh, and uh, growth in e-commerce and uh, basically uh, demand in, um, in in those logistics, especially last mile warehouses. Super, thank you. Frank? I also think that the e-commerce part will definitely um, continue to gather speed and also to gather, to gather weight. One sector which I do not see necessarily developing uh, better than others is the automotive sector, simply because a lot of um, uh, industries are now consolidating and you see rather a trend towards Western Europe than Central Eastern Europe. But again, there's time to catch up on that one. Great, thank you. Renata? I mean, uh, e-commerce already mentioned, and also I would say uh, the expression uh, "just in case, not just in time," which is uh, which means that companies um, prepare for for uh, supply chain disruptions, stockpiling goods, so it will drive uh, also the demand, and also obviously the uh, green um, green policies, which uh, bring, will bring electro electromobility investment. Uh, such uh, already we have examples of LG Ham or G in Poland. Great. I mean, I think that's really interesting, that one about uh, changing from uh, from just in time, uh, because that can have a huge effect. Even a small change can have a huge effect on the on the amount of warehouse capacity that's required. Harry. Um, I believe in the automotive. It was already starting to do other before 2020. But this could see a surge again because cars are not going to go away. And for a while, you might see in parallel the automotive doing combustion, diesel, but also battery. So there's, there could be a surge for a maybe short term period or three, four, five years of these all running in parallel. And you see in the UK last week, it was announced that 2030, there will be no more selling of uh, <laughs> diesel or, or uh, petrol cars. So this is also... Uh, something that will definitely, I think, in the next couple of years, we will see not a decline, but maybe an increase and maybe some new players like your Teslas and some new players maybe from America that are uh, doing battery cars. Interestingly, from your homeland, Harry, that Aberdeen were the first to have a double-decker hydrogen-powered bus. So, you know, it's happening everywhere. Um, last word to you, Robert. Aberdeen, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of agree with what was said. So obviously e-commerce is going to be a big thing going forward. Immobility, another big thing going forward. And the third thing that we are closely watching and monitoring are data centers. Obviously, yeah. this trend was, again, visible. A pandemic kind of made it amazingly kind of expansion 
of that sector. So, so this is this is another thing which we are seeing as a kind of a use of what we do. But uh, for Central Europe, I think um, it is a bit kind of a I think for Europe a bit eye opener that uh, I mean there is this portion of Europe which is extremely efficient, cost wise, efficient labor wise, and not far. And uh, you don't have to travel thousands of kilometers to get your production set up, or you don't have to kind of a source from unknown places. There is a place that you can base your production next door uh, in a very efficient and kind of uh, work ethics efficient also uh, places like Central Europe. So I think this is a big chance for the, for the sector. And I think we should, in Central Europe, and we should probably kind of uh, promote that more uh, going forward. That it is kind of if you take the risk, cost, efficiency, and proximity all together, I think it's a better proposition than Asia. Yeah, okay, just... interesting. Thank you. Um, thank you to everybody for for your for your views in this session, and thank you also to all of the speakers um, and all of the attendees for for your questions and your engagement during during today. Thank you.